So this is a sad story. This woman, Crystal Anderson, is dead at 40, and it just highlights another issue with Black women and our maternal mortality rates in this country. They are atrocious. Okay, this story. Chrissy Anderson died shortly after giving birth to her stillborn daughter. So she is a former Kansas chief cheerleader. She was a yoga instructor and she died at 40. The official chief's cheer Instagram confirmed her death and expressed their condolences as they paid tribute to their former teammate. An obituary also shared that Anderson died unexpectedly on March 20th, um, shortly after the birth of her daughter, Charlotte Willow Anderson, who was born at rest. We are deeply saddened by the recent passing of CC alum, Crystal. Chrissy cheered with us for over 100 games from 2006 to 2011 and 2013 to 2016. The statement began. During that time, she attended the Pro Bowl at the Chiefs um, as the Chiefs representatives in 2015 and served as the captain of her team, cheered during the London game and visited our troops around the world, including Iraq, Kuwait and throughout the United States. The Chiefs cheer statement added that Anderson was loved and adored by her teammates, fans, and strangers who were never strangers for long. After her time as a cheerleader, she continued to share her love of dance and Chiefs cheer by serving in an alumni role on game day practices and at events. The statement continues, we will miss her kind spirit, joyful energy, and her sparkle. Our thoughts and prayers are with her family and loved ones. We will cherish every moment we have with her. At a later date, we will share how we will continue to honor her legacy. Anderson was also a software engineer, according to her obituary, making significant contributions to improving healthcare, including being awarded a patent for developing software that assesses the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. The irony in that statement. She is survived by her husband, Clayton Anderson, whom she married in July 2021, parents Bertha and Burnett Johnson, brother Corey Johnson, and several other family members. Her obituary notes that she was preceded in death by her infant son, James Charles. In an interview with Fox 4, Clayton Anderson said that his wife spiked a fever after their um, daughter was stillborn. He said that she battled sepsis, which led to organ failure and three surgeries. I'm going to come back to that part. I feel lost, Clayton Anderson said. There's a lot of people in this house and it feels empty. Sepsis is when the body responds improperly to an infection, causing organs to work poorly, according to the Mayo Clinic. Sepsis may also progress to septic shock with blood pressure dropping and damaging organs that can lead to death. Black maternal mortality rates have long been high in the United States. Black women are nearly th um, three times more likely to die during childbirth than white women, according to the CDC. In February, Dr. Jessica Shepard, an OBGYN at Septum Med Plus Wellness in Dallas, told um, Today.com to reduce the Black maternal mortality rate. There needs to be a fundamental change in the actual foundation of healthcare systems. That would be addressing insurance coverage. That would be increasing access to resources and tertiary care in hospitals or systems that are in food deserts and underprivileged areas. Additionally, OBGYN Dr. Siobhan Momin nelson says studies that show people who are treated by doctors who look like themselves have better outcomes. Black physicians make up about 5 to 6 percent of all physicians. Black female physician, physicians make up 2 percent of all physicians, she said. If you only have 2 to 5 percent of people who look like you as doctors, the likelihood that someone would be cared for by someone who is Black is very low. So that is a call to arms to get our daughters into um, sciences and biology and things that will lead up to going into the medical field and to be physicians because we need more people that look like us. I said I was going to go back to she battled sepsis. In some of these forced birth states that just have an all outright abortion ban, they literally know that the fetus is incompatible with life. They already know that there will not be a full-term pregnancy yet. And I don't know if that is this woman's situation or was this woman's situation, but we know in this climate where abortion is being battled everywhere, that it, it is a possibility. And I have heard of these women that are almost dying 
And then that is when they will take out the fetal material. And it makes me so mad because we already know that black maternal mortality rates are so high. We already know that so many women are struggling in this country. And even if she were to survive, what kind of quality of life would she have? Yet these doctors are just letting this happen. Yet we're fighting um, these bands. They are going after, they are forcing women to stay pregnant with these fetuses that they know are non-viable. And it's maddening and it's saddening. And so many people are losing women because of it. And like I said, I don't know if that's what happened with this, but I've seen stories talking about sepsis and women almost having to die and blood pressure dropping. And I've seen that like in the aftermath of Roe v. Wade falling and how many women need to die because of that. Like literally folks really think that, you know, women are just having sex and then willy nilly needing to get rid of these pregnancies when married women need to have this type of care as well, because not all pregnancies are viable. Anyways, jump in the comments. Let me know what you think. Don't forget to like, comment and share. So I read a lot of news and I am always on social media, but this one slipped through the cracks. A Nebraska senator who name checked a colleague while reading a book about a grape scene is now under investigation. When people act like se actual harassment is just men being misunderstood or they just said, you know, how are you doing today? Or you look nice today. They are completely fabricating things because they know that these people are seeing things that are completely out of line if folks are getting investigated or getting HR involved. This is one of those times. A Republican senator, um, I'm sorry, a Republican Nebraska lawmaker who stirred a firestorm of controversy by repeatedly name checking a fellow senator while reading a graphic account of grape from a best-selling memoir on the floor of the legislature is now under investigation for SE actual harassment. The investigation into state Senator Steve um, Holloran of Hastings by legislature's executive board was announced on Wednesday by Senator Ray Aguilar, a fellow Republican and chairman of the board. Aguilar said he filed the harassment complaint himself after witnessing Holler Holloran's remarks on the floor Monday night. This formal investigation will be thorough and by the book. Aguilar read from the statement on the floor. I can assure members of this body, legislative staff, and all Nebraskans that any and all allegations of workplace harassment will be properly investigated and addressed as provided by the executive board policy. More than anything, it is important that all members of the legislature and legislative staff feel safe in the workplace, Aguilar said. A panel of three lawmakers will be named to oversee the investigation and will hire an outside investigator to look into um, Halloran's actions. A report will be, made, re will be made public within 45 days, Aguilar said. Halloran said the legislative rules on harassment and investigations prevent him from commenting on the probe other than to note, I'll defend myself. Now let's look deeper into what happened. You cannot convince me that people are this dense. One day after Senator Steve Halloran read a graphic grape scene from a novel and inserted his colleagues' names to make a point, state senators are calling for more accountability and protection for members of the Nebraska legislature from workplace harassment. Dunbar Senator Julie Slama called on Senator Halloran to resign from legislature. If you were in your job and you got up and said that one of your coworkers in front of everybody else in the company, you wouldn't have a job the next day, Slama told 1011 News. Me calling on Senator Halloran to resign is absolutely in line with just a very basic level of decorum and professional standards we have to demand from any workplace in the state of Nebraska. The comments happened during a debate about a bill banning obscene materials from schools. To show his support for that bill, Halloran read a section of the book Lucky, which shares the story of a grape survivor. Halloran said the book is required reading for some high schoolers. At one section of his reading, he said, I want a, I want a BJ, Senator Kavanaugh. Tuesday, Halloran told his fellow senators he was referring to Senator John Kavanaugh, not Senator Michaela Kavanaugh in his speech, as if that makes a difference. <laughs> I'm not trying to offend this man. I am using the woman's name. <laughs> I apologize for interjecting senators' names in the middle of reading a transcription, Halloran said. 
Should I have done that? Maybe not. But what I was trying to do was get their attention to what I was reading from the book. Throughout Tuesday morning, multiple senators call on Halloran to apologize and take full responsibility for the impacts of his comments. Why people want folks to apologize for something that they meant is beyond my imagination. But quit take, telling people to apologize. They won't mean it. This includes both Senators John and Michaela Kavanaugh. You're saying you owe me an apology for inserting me accidentally into this sentence, but you're missing the harm that the action caused to everyone around us, John said. He also said Halloran is missing out on the point that reading in the book Lucky and the value people derive from hearing a survivor share their story, including hope for victims and increasing empathy for those who haven't been victimized. What you did in this conversation about obscenity is you took a story and inserted your colleagues into it for effect. You created a new work that is uh, far more purient than the original content because you, in essence, sexualize the people you work with. Another senator, Brad Von Gillern, uh, um, echoed John Kavanaugh saying Halloran's apology didn't go far enough. He said two male members of his families are SA survivors and that he was harmed by Halloran's speech. Being a father of a great victim is a very hard thing and maybe it's PTSD, I don't know, but when you hear a story that brings back personal memories and hard memories, it doesn't matter what your gender is, Von Gillern said. He said if he had heard his name in that passage, he would have taken it personally and that Halloran's apology doesn't go far enough. While Senator Halloran, I believe you meant to harm. No personal harm, a conditional apology is not a full apology, Von Giller said. I encourage you to search your heart and hope your perspective on this changes to some degree, and I hope anyone negatively impacted finds healing over that. Senator Michaela Kavanaugh agreed with Swama that there needs to be more than an apology. She called for greater protection for senators who are the subject of inappropriate speech in the chamber. I believe in freedom of speech, and I know speech on this floor is protected speech, but it is misguided to think there isn't a difference between appropriate speech and protected speech. It should not be tolerated, Michaela said. Swama told 1011 the same thing. What happened was out of line and we have so many feelings about it and then no action happens because those in leadership, especially those involved with or on the executive board, fail to want to move forward on any real HR policy that has teeth to it, Slama said. In a speech on the legislative floor Tuesday morning, Slama says she's been on the receiving end of similar comments when she said, Former Senator Ernie Chambers talked about enslaving and raping her and claimed she owed her political career to favors of the flesh. Okay. She said there is a lack of human resources structure to protect senators and other legislative staff. She said there are three actions that can be taken against the senator, including a former letter, a censure vote that has no impact, and a former expulsion from the body. As of Tuesday evening, there was no indication that any of those actions would be taken against Halloran. Halloran didn't reply to requests for comment. Senator Ray Aguilar, head of the executive board, said, while I can neither confirm nor deny whether a complaint has been filed against Halloran at this time, I can assure you that Nebraskans, uh, that all complaints will be taken seriously and addressed, provided the executive board policy. Whether or not there should be punishment is something Senator Wade Tools of punishment are wrong, are the wrong remedy for speech that we find offensive and disagree with. The remedy is more speech, Danielle Conrad said. The remedy is to focus on measures that impact Nebraskans that we can find a significant amount of consensus for. John Kavanaugh said he'd stand up for Halloran's right to free speech the, despite being the target of his comments. Don't feel bad for me. I don't want you to think I'm ashamed of what's happening here. I'm proud of the work I do. I'm proud of the stances I take. And Senator Halloran, I will stand up for your right to exercise um, freedom when it's even when it's offensive to me. All right, so this is his apology, Halloran's. I have an apology to make. I'm not going to make the apology to take the load off my shoulders in the way I presented what I presented yesterday, but I apologize for interjecting the senator's names in the middle of reading a transcription, transcribed testimony in a public hearing in reference to a book that in some schools and some schools require reading. It was a hard thing to read. No, I was not tri trivializing great. I was reading from a book that's required reading for some students. Should I have interjected the senator's names? No. Sometimes we do things on the floor in the midst of making a statement that we shouldn't have done. Once the transcribers have transcribed what I said, I think you'll notice that I first referenced Senator John Kavanaugh. Should I have done that? Maybe not. But what I was trying to do was get their attention to what I was reading from this book.
In the middle of the reading of that, it was clear to me that some people were not paying attention, so I called their name out, and I shouldn't have done that. It was a mistake to do that. That This apology is full of poop, period. He is full of it. I do not believe him, and we shall see how this gets handled. Um, but like they were saying, it's not simply about these names that were interjected. He took the book. It seems out of context. I haven't read Lucky, but that is what they do. And I'm sure that this book was vetted by people that actually read the whole book. And I'm sure it has some substance or, you know, a point that they're trying to make in reading it. And it's not just simply for the shock value of it, um, interjecting SE actual material to students. Jump in the comments. Let me know what you think about this one. Don't forget to like, comment, and share. We should all know that the Christo fascist force birthers won't stop, even if the Supreme Court um, levels a, a judgment against them. So this article is titled, Justices Were Skeptical of Spavortion Pill Argument. Um, the force birther groups have backup plans. You know they're going to keep coming. Project 2025 is out there. Their game plan is out there. They do not want women having the rights to choose anything to do with their reproduction because they are Christian fascists and they do not believe in women's rights. So let's get into this article. Force birthers and elected officials have a backup plan should the Supreme Court reject their arguments for nationwide restrictions of the abortion field microprestone. In fact, they have several. The lawsuit that went before the high court Tuesday challenging uh, federal re regulation of the pills is just one piece of the movement's strategy to curb women's rights, a conservative goal since before Roe fell, and the medication gained popularity. The sprawling and loosely coordinated tactics include other legal challenges in state and federal courts, state and federal legislations, executive orders, pressure campaigns against pharmacies that dispense the pills, and the use of environmental and wildlife laws. Yes, that is where these people are going. It is so important for y'all to know what these people are doing. The strategies are likely to take on greater importance after the Supreme Court's skeptical reception of the challenge to the FDA decisions loosening access to the pills. During oral arguments, Justices Neil Gorsuch and Amy Coney Barrett Two pivotal votes in the case expressed doubts about the harms of anti abortion physicians claimed they face when treating patients who have taken the pills and needed follow-up care. The two justices also questioned whether curtailing access to the drug nationwide would be an overly broad remedy. We're not putting all our chips on this one case, says Jesse Sutherland, the federal policy director for Americans United for Life. Since chemicals from abortion is making up the majority of them, it has to be a priority. Some of the movement's other plans depend on former President Donald Trump returning to the White House in 2025. Others depend on Republicans winning majorities in the House and Senate. That is why it is so important to vote down ticket in the presidential vote is not the most important. It's all of it. All of it is important because Project 2025, they're putting people in all of these positions. All right. But some um, but some can advance regardless of the outcome in November, leaning on GOP state attorneys, um, leaning right leaning judges and the grassroots grassroots pressure that's abortion opponents credit for gradually eroding Rose protection over the last 50 years. On Tuesday, for example, the, the anti abortion group Students for Life of America held simultaneous protests outside the Supreme Court and outside the headquarters of Walgreens in Chicago, part of a bigger campaign to boycott and picket the pharmacy chains that have agreed to dispense mifoprestone in some states. The group is also trying to use wastewater, endangered species, and other environmental laws to argue for restrictions on mifoprestone and have petitioned the EPA to investigate the impact of people taking the pills at home and flushing the pills down the toilet. If the agency rejects or ignores the petitions, and it, it is expected to do so, Students for Life will sue. The Supreme Court case is not the hook we're hanging our whole strategy on, says Christy Hamrick, the spokesperson for Students for Life of America. Clearly, chemical smoke abortion is the wave of the future, and it's a tidal wave destroying so much life. 2025 and beyond. Students for Life is also part of a coalition of more than 100 conservative organizations led by the Heritage Foundation, preparing executive action for a potential second Trump administration. That's the reason why I keep highlighting and talking about Project 2025. Please understand what is going on. This is the handmaid's tale. They are aiming for Gilead. Okay, Heritage's Project 2025, 
manifesto suggests many ways to institutionalize the post Dobbs environment, including directing the FDA to rescind its two decade old approval for mifoprestone. Should there be delays on that front, the coalition urges the interim step of moving to eliminate the dangerous teleabortion and abortion by mail distribution, essentially having a potential Trump administration do what the Supreme Court might not. The document also alludes to, but doesn't name, the 150-year-old Comstock Act, a long dormant federal law that bans mail delivery of any lewd or lascivious material, including any instrument, substance, drug, medicine, or thing that could be used for a abortion. Though Project 2025 only calls for the enforcement of long-standing federal laws that prohibit the mailing and interstate carriage of abortion drug, legal experts say the policy would also cut off access to medical equipment used for both um, surgical abortion and other medical procedure. The Comstock Act, made by this man named Anthony Comstock, really restricted women's rights. It put a um, it put restrictions on birth control in general. It um, put women in jail for giving out um, birth control information. It was a terrible plan, and that is what had to be overturned for women to get access to birth control in general. It is not. This is not a good thing for them to um, try to reestablish because it really does. It, it strips women of rights that we have finally gotten in the 1960s and 70s. Creating not only a de facto national ban, but also potential disruptions for routine care. Democrats and uh, abortion rights activists see Comstock and other executive actions outlined in Project 2025 as some of the biggest looming threats and are working to make the plans make the plans a leading example of the stakes in the November elections. It really needs to be highlighted over and over. It needs to be highlighted in multiple spaces, multiple platforms, what these people are doing and what it could mean, because it's not just going to impact pregnant women and women needing care. It's going to impact people across the board. Trump's close advisors and allies have publicly released a comprehensive strategy to rip away access to reproductive health care, including banning medications from abortion and restricting access to contraception without the help of Congress. Biden campaign manager Julie Chavez Rodriguez told reporters on Monday. They have a literal blueprint to expand the chaos and cruelty he's already created nationwide, even in states where some abortion remains legal. The Trump campaign did not respond to a request for comment, and while the former president has recently angered anti-abortion groups pledging to compromise with Democrats on the issue if elected, he also boasted about appointing the judges who overturned Roe and floated support for a national ban at 15 or 16 weeks of pregnancy. Action in Congress and state capitals. Whether Trump wins in November, um, anti abortion groups are also pursuing state-level restrictions on the pills through, um, through, through both legislation and legal action by GOP attorneys general. 14 states have near total bans on abortion, including medications for abortion, and about a dozen or more ban telehealth prescriptions of the pills or place other restrictions on their use. Americans United for Life and other anti abortion groups are drafting model legislation for additional states they hope will join those ranks, including policies like ultrasound requirements, mandatory waiting periods, and specific scripts doctors are required to read to patients seeking the pills. It is clear the states can no longer rely on the FDA to re regulate chemical abortion, argue one policy paper ALU developed along with the Students for Life, Su Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life, America and other influential groups. Thus, lawmakers must incorporate state guard safeguards into state law. Republican members of Congress who urged the Supreme Court to impose restrictions on drugs in the amicus brief also hope to take matters into their own hands should they hold the House majority and flip the Senate in November. One GOP bill endorsed by the ALU and other um, several Several other anti abortion groups would force the FDA to do what challengers asked of the Supreme Court, reimpose the original restrictions of mifoprestone and ban mail delivery and telemedicine prescription of the drug. It would also go further by barring the FDA from approving bills and pills in the future. 
Another bill would prohibit public colleges and universities from stocking microprestone, a rebuke to California and other states that require the pills to be available to students on those campuses, and another would simply ban the pills nationwide. Even with a filibuster-proof majority, Republicans could try to push these policies by attaching them to must-pass spending bills. That strategy failed this year with President Joe Biden and the White House, but it could have more luck in a second Trump administration, especially if Republicans control the Senate. We need to be doing more. Representative um, Chris Smith, who's, who leads the House Pro-Life Caucus, told Politico, Dobbs, in my opinion, began the national debate on spam abortion. It didn't end it. I agree. It didn't end it. We need to understand and continue to talk about this and keep pushing it into different platforms because women need to understand what is at stake um, and vote and vote. These Republicans, these Christian fascists are strategically working to strip women's rights in multiple fashions, like 